everyone joining us from Wamba World here from the University of York. I'm Dr. Becca Grose. I'm a lecturer at the, here at the University in Roman and Early Medieval History. Philip Matti Matijak is a writer and educator who has worked in Zimbabwe, Italy and England. He is the author of a number of works about the ancient world, including Chronicle of the Roman Republic, The Rulers of Ancient Rome from Romulus to Augustus, The Enemies of Rome from Hannibal to Attila the Hun, and The Sons of Caesar, Imperial Rome's First Dynasty. But today, he'll be revealing the lost peoples and cultures who flourished and fought for survival alongside the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. Without further ado, Matty, the floor is yours. Thanks, Becca. <laughs> and um, thanks to the York Festival of Ideas for the invitation. Um, I'm actually calling this in from the Monashi Mountains of Western Canada, where I don't get a lot of opportunities to discuss what is both my job and my hobby, so I'm grateful to be here. Um, this talk is based on research which I did for two books, Lost and Forgotten Peoples of the Ancient World and Lost and Forgotten Cities of the Ancient World. Now these books go into great detail on specific examples, so I'll stay away from these here as much as possible but you're still going to get a lot of odd names and a barrage of dates. And you'll have to excuse my occasional excursus if um, I run into a particularly interesting rabbit hole while I'm talking about a particular subject. I'm using rough notes here, but I'll endeavor not to get too sidetracked. So what we're going to be looking at here is three aspects of the topic of lost and forgotten people. The first is, how do a people or a civilization become lost? The next question is, how do they become forgotten? And my final point I'm going to make is that although many of these people are lost and forgotten, they haven't actually gone away. And what I mean by that, I will explain as we go into the talk. Um, something else to point out on the technical side is there are some peoples who are 100% lost and forgotten. And by definition, I'm not going to be talking very much about them because I don't have any subject matter. So I'll refer to peoples as lost and forgotten if academics know quite a lot about them. But if you mention them in ordinary conversation, you'll get nothing but blank looks. This actually happens a lot to me at dinner parties. You know, what do you mean you don't know the difference between a Samnite or a Sabine? This is basic ethnography. One's a Latin people, the other's Oscans. Anyway, um, going on to getting lost. How does a people or a civilization get lost? Let's start with catastrophic disasters, Atlantis style. Now, the best example of this is the Minoans, who became lost as a result of violent seismic activity when the volcano of Thera erupted in around 1500 BC. And the result was tsunamis, earthquakes, and volcanism that knocked the foundations, quite literally, out of the Minoan civilization. However, um, despite a fairly popular misconception that um, this is how civilizations get lost. It's actually quite rare. Um, I blame Indiana Jones for this belief, but um, let's move on to more common ways that civilizations get lost. Um, invasion works in terms of um, removing a people or a culture from the map, not because it changes the people of the invaded country, um, DNA studies have shown that this is very rare that you get population replacement, but because it changes the culture from the top down. And there's a debate to be had how much a people still exist if their culture and way of life has been completely changed. Um, a good example of this in the ancient world is what happened to the Etruscans in the first centuries BC and AD. The Etruscans were a separate and a highly developed civilization 
that gradually merged into Roman culture so that by the time of about the mid-century AD, they'd pretty much ceased to exist as a separate people. So that's one way of getting lost. Um, another way, and a way that is terrifyingly relevant to us today, is climate change. This is not a new phenomenon. Um, one of the people I looked at um, with fascinated horror are a tribe called the Garamantes, who um, lived on the Maghreb in Northern Africa. They had a flourishing culture and civilization that was gradually succumbing to the desertification from the Sahara. And they built literally hundreds of miles of canals and aqueducts to try and keep their crops going. And these days, if you travel to Libya, you can actually stand and look at these ruins in the middle of the desert that once upon a time were flourishing fields and orchards. And I'll give you an example of this from another part of the world, Mesopotamia. And we actually have it written by an almost contemporary text called The Curse of Akkad, which describes the fall of Akkadian culture. According to the saga, this is due to the action of the gods, whom a king called Naram Sin deeply annoyed. But some of this may sound familiar. I'm now quoting from the text. All the rain went back to the heavens. The land was deprived of grain. Messengers no longer traveled the highways. The courier's boat no longer passed along the rivers. The barbarians drove the goats from their pens. Brigates infested the highways. The doors laid as lodged in all the foreign lands. The established gardens were within the walls and not on the wide plain outside. As before the time when cities were built, the large fields yielded no grain, the marshes yielded no fish, the irrigated orchards yielded neither oil nor wine, and the thick clouds did not rain, the Magurum plant did not grow. In other words, what we're seeing here is the result of a major shift in the climate, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. But we can also look at one of the oldest cities in the world, the um, city of Sumerian Ur, founded around 4000 BC. And again, when you look at Ur now, you see ruins on a desiccated plain where once there were fields of fertile crops. And part of the reason I am embarrassed to say is due to the Canadians. Um, that is to say, around 8,500 years ago, the Canadian interior was a vast freshwater lake formed by melting glaciers as the interstitial period of the current ice age really got into its stride. Eventually, that ice dam broke and the water, freshwater in huge amounts, flooded into the Atlantic Ocean, raising sea levels and changing the climate. And this is actually one of the sources that people assume is responsible for the concepts of the, I say, biblical flood. But we also get stories of this flood in Greek mythology, in Mesopotamian myth, and quite a few other world cultures. So we do lose cultures to climate change. And in fact, when we look at the Kushite civilization, we see an even more chilling example in the city of Meroe, where they had a very flourishing city, which indulged in a lot of metalwork and ironwork. And as a result, they chopped down all the trees around them, creating an ecological disaster that eventually led to the abandonment of the city. But I'm going to go back a little bit further and point again to the significance of climate change. And that is that climate change is possibly also responsible for civilization as we know it. And I'm going to take you back to a city called Katalhoyuk, which was founded in Anatolia um, 
sometime around 7,000 BC. Now, this is contrary to the standard idea of how civilizations develop, because we used to think that civilization developed when people discovered agriculture, they could then stay in one place and they started to build cities because they had crop surplus from the farming. And then we developed the hierarchies of priests, soldiers, and governors. And now we're discovering that isn't actually the case. In Katalhoyuk, the area was so fertile that people were able to stay in one place while living as hunter-gatherers. They got fish from the marshes, they got wild fruits from the forests, and they um, hunted and to some extent cultivated animals. And then the climate changed. And as the climate got warmer and drier, people were unwilling to return to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So instead, they started cultivating the area where they lived. So we've actually got a reverse here. We've got climate change creating a culture and agriculture developing as a result of there being cities rather than the other way around. Now, before I go any further here, I'd also like to point out that um, if anyone wants to comment on anything they're hearing, um, you can either save it up for the Q&A um, session at the end, or you can jump right in now and just um, point out that um, I've either got something completely wrong and referred to Neo-Assyrians when I should be talking about Neo-Babylonians, or just um, add an extra point, which I'm um, if this space will then include into the talk. But before we do that, we'll just take a look at the normal way that a people become lost and forgotten. And that's the mundane system that basically is people become lost in time. Cultures are not static. Migration, assimilation, and technical change all alter how a culture goes. So we could safely say that the people living today in Rio de Janeiro have more in common with the people of York than the people of York have now with the culture of York a thousand years ago. So a people can become lost and forgotten simply because the world moves on. Um, Damascus as a city became a big deal in the first millennium because the people called the Aramaeans moved in. But there'd been a settlement there for at least 6,000 years before then. So as people move around, and for all of recorded history, there have been migrations of people. As they move in, they change the culture of an area. As technology changes the culture, bit by bit, a people evolve into becoming a different people and a different culture. And that is what happens to the vast majority of the peoples that we look at. Now, I'm going to give you a case study here, which is one of the most settled and longest civilized areas of the world, which is Mesopotamia. And civilization there kicks off around 8,000 years ago with a people called the Sumerians. Although archeology span is finding some interesting traces of pottery and things, which suggests there's another layer beneath the Sumerians, but we don't know too much about that. We do know that the Sumerians got plenty of input on how to be civilized from people of the Nile and the Indus valleys. But we're looking at a point at this stage where peoples are still figuring out things like um, how to build a city. Do you need streets? Where do you put the windows, in the roof or in the walls? All these things are still being worked out at this very early stage. Um, the Sumerians um, lasted until around 2300 BC when they were replaced by the Akkadian people. And bear in mind what I say about replaced. We're not talking about an invasion. We're talking about a gradual filtering of people in and give and take as the two cultures merged with ideas and probably also merged with marriage and this kind of thing. We then get a king, Sargon the Great, who creates one of the world's first empires. Before then, peoples lived in individual cities and cultivated the land around. It was Sargon who first got the idea 
of knitting this lot together and actually creating um, a empire, a combined thing. And next up, after the Arcadians, we get the Assyrians, who at their peak occupied most of the Middle East. The Hittites conquered lands occupied by Arameans, Eritureans, Hittites, Varanians, and a lot of other people who had a lot of influence on the region. In fact, Jesus probably spoke Aramean. Now, one of the things about the Assyrians is they mention people such as the charmingly named Lullaby, who only appear because they met the Assyrians, um, albeit in rather the same way as the sentence meets the full stop. Um, because the Assyrians were one of those few cultures that did believe in destroying other cultures. And they did this in the way that I've described, which is destruction by assimilation. An example of this is the 10 lost tribes of Israel, who are one of our lost peoples. When the Assyrians conquered Israel, they took 10 of those tribes and whipped them off and settled them in other parts of the Assyrian Empire. And there, the culture gradually faded away, and um, the peoples of Israel, the 10 lost tribes, merged with the native peoples of the area in which they had been forcibly resettled. And the result of that is, of course, that we have the lost tribes of Israel who have turned up anywhere from Japan to Nigeria, if we are to believe people who claim that descent. Although it has to be said that um, modern DNA testing has managed to massacre more of the lost tribes than um, the Assyrians ever did in terms of elimination. Now we move on to the perpetual rivals of the Assyrians, who are the Babylonians. They also had their own civilization and culture. And when the Assyrians had a particularly destructive civil war, the Babylonians ganged up with some other peoples and descended upon the capital of the Assyrians, which is Nineveh, and literally tore the place apart brick by brick. So once again, we have an Indiana Jones type catastrophic destruction of a culture here. The Babylonians then established their own empire in 626. So we're moving well into the historical period now. And the people driving the Neo-Babylonian bus were a tribe called the Chaldeans. And we actually know quite a lot about them in modern culture. Because when we talk of someone being Daniel in the lion's den, it was a Neo-Babylonian lion's den that Daniel was chucked into. Um, it was the Neo-Babylonian gods who were described as having feet of clay. And the fall of the Neo-Babylonian empire is the writing on the wall. So these are examples of how the Chaldean people, who aren't that widely known, have actually managed to get a toe well into modern culture. And I'll give you two other examples of that, because the Babylonians tried to finish off the job that the Egyptians start, that the Assyrians started, and they shifted the remaining tribes of Israel to Mesopotamia. And as a result, the Hebrew exile gave rise to various epics of opera and song, including the famous Rivers of Babylon by Bomi M, and in a more cultured way, the song Va Pensiero, also known as the Hebrew slave song from Verdi's opera Nabucco. The Hebrews, by the way, were taken back home by Cyrus, who established the Persian Empire, which was in turn replaced by the Seleucid Empire, which was in its own turn replaced by the Parthian Empire, and so the great wheel of history rolls along. But when we get to the Chaldeans and the Neo-Babylonians, we are moving into the classical era. Um, and Jane asks, have I extensively studied the Bible to um, influence and prove my conclusions? And I have to confess, I have not. However, I have read the work of people who have done that studying. And um, as they've been peer reviewed, um, I am going to accept those conclusions. So um, 
we now move into the period of classical history. When we look at classical history, we have to look at the difference between that and ancient history. Classical history starts in the first millennium BC. In other words, when we start talking about Greeks and Romans, most of the history of civilization had already happened. By the time we talk of the Greeks and Romans and us today, we're already on final chapters. Um, I'll give you a few examples of this. Um, when the Greek historian Herodotus, um, who was around at the time of the Persian Wars, traveled to Egypt, he saw the pyramids. The pyramids were at that time half as old as they are today. Or to put it another way, um, the time between Cleopatra of Egypt and lover of Mark Antony and the invention of the Zoom internet call is shorter than the time between Cleopatra and the building of the pyramids. There's a lot of ancient history in the time that we are looking at here. And this is why peoples are forgotten. The simple reason is there's just only that much history that we can take in. And we tend to focus on the history that is most relevant to us today. So I'll give another example, and that is an archeological expedition to a temple founded by Naram Sin of Akkad, who reigned about 4,200 years ago. This expedition unearthed the temple, tried to date some of the artifacts and actually attempted some restoration work. The excavator was a chap called Nabondius, he was king of Babylon in 550 BC. But for him, the fall of Akkad was as distant as the fall of the Roman Empire is for us today. So when we look at history, we tend to compress it in time the further back we go. And um, I did this by um, doing, I checked this by doing a quick random browse of the internet where I found surveys asking for the most important events in the whole of history. And the Vox Pop responses tended to stick to the last 200 years, let alone the last 2000. So if you were to ask people what were the most important events of the last 200 years, they could easily give you a dozen. Does anyone remember anything important from the fourth millennium BC? No? Okay. How about the invention of the sailboat, the potter's wheel, base 60 mathematics, like the 60 minutes that are allocated for this talk, astronomy, metallurgy, and irrigation. All these things happened back then and were highly important, but um, they become disconnected from the common experience and the peoples that invented and developed these things drop from memory. I was particularly taken by one survey, which was looking for the 100 most important people in history, listed by user responses. Now, I had great hopes for Sargon the Great of Akkad. He did work out a legal code. He did create the world's first um, empire. And um, he was quite a fascinating character on his own. Unfortunately, because he lived so long ago, he didn't make the list. However, Justin Bieber was there somewhere in the high 80s. So what I'm trying to say is people and events get forgotten in ancient history simply because, as, you, as the sign says, objects appear smaller in the rear view mirror. So that's how people get lost and forgotten, but they haven't gone. When we look at people like the Hattians, the Histos, the Elamites, the Nubians, and the Phrygians, they're still there, they still influence our culture today, and they still have an effect. Um, for an example, um, let's take the Phrygians. Heard of them? Okay, have you heard about the most famous of the Phrygian kings, a guy called King Midas, who everything he touched turned to gold? Or when Alexander the Great invaded the area, um, he 
um, cut through the Gordian knot. Um, have you ever wondered where the Gordian knot was? Well, it was in Gordia, which is the capital of Phrygia. Or, and um, for here I've arranged a little slideshow showing an item of Phrygian clothing that you all know about, but um, haven't actually realized where it comes from. So let's take a look at some Phrygian slides. There's one from an ancient mosaic showing the headgear. And here we have a Phrygian cap as worn by a French revolutionary, because it's also known as the, Lib Lydia, as the Liberty cap, because Phrygian slaves readopted their native headgear when they were freed in ancient Rome. Let's try another one. Ah, here we have a Phrygian cap sitting on the Senate of the United States. So we're getting pretty relevant today. But now, to really put the cap on it, we have another Phrygian cap on a highly recognizable figure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, what I'm trying to make about the point of these forgotten peoples is they haven't gone. Their influence is all around us, embedded in our culture in ways we never even think about. This happens directly and indirectly. The Mediterranean, we think of it as being the Greeks and Romans, and depending on your taste, we add the Egyptians or Hebrews. And that just isn't the case. What we are looking at is in some ways a single shared culture that goes all the way from Spain to India and beyond. So let's use some examples. We talk about the Romans, but an awful lot of Roman culture came from the Etruscans, and an awful lot of Etruscan culture came from Syria and from Greece. Um, the Romans, for example, picked up divination from the Etruscans. So if something augurs well or is a good augury, um, that's an Etruscan divination. If something is ominous, we can thank the Etruscans again for that. So let's have a look at the seven kings of Rome. The first one was Romulus, descendant of an alleged family of immigrants from Anatolia to be precise, just as Dido from the Phoenician city of Tyre is the alleged founder of Carthage in North Africa. Another interesting Roman king is Tarquin. His name actually comes from the city of Tarquinia in Etruria, but his family weren't Etruscan. They were a bunch of exiled aristocrats from Corinth. So as you can see, even if the seven kings of Rome may be mythological, there is this idea that people moved around the Mediterranean and often moved into other cultures and exchanged stuff with them. And since I'm talking of the seven kings of Rome, I'll give you another example of Indo-European or Eurasian culture as a common thing. We have the seven kings of Rome because seven is a special number in Eurasian culture. Consider the seven gateways traveled by Inanna during her descent into the Akkadian underworld, the seven worlds of Hindu cosmology, the seven steps taken by the Buddha at birth, the seven pillars of wisdom in Islam. And of course, in Western culture, we've got the seven days of the week, the seven hills of Rome, the seven seas, and the seven wonders of the world. I could go on, but why is seven particularly solid as a number here, it's because it is the universal encompassing number. The number four in all of these cultures represents what is solid, tangible of the earth, which is why the earth has four corners. And the Assyrians reckoned they ruled all parts of it. Three, on the other hand, is the spiritual number. There were trinities and triads um, around many years ago. Consider the one from 6,000 years back, of Shamash, Nana, and Iana, who were the Akkadian gods of the sun, the moon, and the stars. The Romans had the Capitoline triad of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. So three, as Pythagoras said way back in the fifth century, is the sacred number. So if you take four, the number of the tangible, and three, the number of the sacred, you get seven, which is a prime number, and therefore in all of these cultures, a special number in itself. I mention this to point out 
that when we talk about the Greeks and Romans, we're not just talking about Greeks and Romans. We're talking about all the cultures that fed into them and which the Romans and Greeks in turn fed stuff out to. Um, it's kind of like a feedback loop. So when we look at the Greeks, for example, um, Herodotus pointed out a lot of the Greek gods come from Egypt. And indeed, if you look at Greek mythology, so do a lot of the Greeks. If you look at um, the supplicants by Aeschylus, you discover that they were the children of the King Belus of Egypt and Erechio, the daughter of the god Nilus. So the original Greeks were Danaans or Egyptians. Now, where did the Egyptians get a lot of their culture from? Well, they got it from the country that's got even more pyramids than Egypt, and that's the Kushite kingdom to the south. In fact, um, one of the Egyptian dynasties of 656 BC was a black dynasty of pharaohs from Kush. And Kush is another of those largely forgotten kingdoms, an early cradle of civilization um, in what today would be northern Sudan. It actually produced several different peoples in the years between about 2500 and um, 1500 BC. They controlled the Nile Valley between the first and fourth cataracts, which is an area as large as Egypt. And they and the Egypts were constantly in touch, whether through warfare, trade, cultural exchange, or intermarriage. So even though the Kushites had a distinct language and culture and ethnicity, they were part of the Egyptian culture, which, as I've pointed out, was part of the Mediterranean culture, particularly the Greek. Um, now we'll give another example of that by looking at some language pictograms that are developed from uh, Luwian, Kurian, and a couple of other forgotten people. Here we are. Okay. Now, what we have here is the development of writing, which was very much a team effort. The Egyptians developed hieroglyphs, which are little pictures which contained the meaning within the picture, pictograms, or since we seem to be reverting to 6,000 years ago, emojis. Now, during the um, period of about the fourth century BC, um, other peoples moved into the area and worked as mercenaries for the Egyptians. And these Semitic peoples mostly adopted the Egyptian habit of using pictograms but instead of them being representative of things, they made the talk representative of sounds. And the result is that you find this particularly in the Hattian civilization, the pictures still stood for things, but the things stood for the sound. So we look at the first letter, we get elf, which is of course our modern letter A. So what I'd like you to do is not turn, rotate this pictogram to the right, which is um, how we do it in the modern language to get ourselves a capital A, but revolve it to the left to get ALF, which if we look at the Punic language or the Phoenician language is bull. And what you can see there is a little bull with a triangular head, a pair of ears and two horns sticking up. And when we move on to Beth, Beth is the B sound, which is why we have alphabet. And Beth is a house. So if we rotate this one through 90 degrees to the right, we see a little triangular house with something like a chimney sticking next to it. And we can continue seeing this with H, Heth, which is the pictogram for a fence. And slightly moving off the edge of the picture, we have sin, which is wave, and which is where we still get the W, which is basically a pictogram from a wave. Now, this wasn't developed by the Phoenicians, this wasn't developed by the Egyptians, and this wasn't developed by the Greeks. They all combined together to make a form of lettering, which was then adopted in different ways by the Greeks with Greek script, the Egyptians with a script called Koine, and by the Etruscans with something much nearer, the Roman script, which we use today. Now, how did these ideas spread? Um, they spread through 
what you could call Afro-Eurasian culture. The Nile was a highway bringing goods and ideas up from the south and down to the south. The Silk Road ran from east to west and carried a lot more than just silks. It also carried ideas such as the concept of legalism, which was developed in China. Also less known is the Amber Road, which has been running since at least the 16th century BC, which brought goods, peoples, and ideas down from the north to the Mediterranean world. So for instance, the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun, who lived in the 14th century BC, um, in his tomb and actually on his body are ornaments made of amber that comes from what today would be modern Scandinavia. And it is due to correspondence with those northern peoples, such as the Frisians, who gave us Chu, who is the um, fellow who is now embodied in Tuesday, and the gods of the Germanic Chatti, Alamani, and other tribes um, gave us the gods who later evolved into Woden, Thor, and Freya, or respectively, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Another example of lost peoples who crop up every day of the week. I can keep going with these examples. I can give you the duality of good and evil, which comes from Persia, maths and astronomy from Babylon, legalism from China, we've touched upon, coinage from Lydia. And if you've never heard of the Lydians um, and the development of coinage, try somebody else, a chap called Croesus, um, who got very rich as a matter of interest because. Um, all the gold flowed down from the kingdom of Midas into the area of um, the Lydians. I could also mention, by the way, talking of that, um, a people called the Colchians, because what they used to do is they used to filter gold particles out of the river by laying sheepskins into the river, and the gold would get caught in the fine hairs of the sheepskin, giving us the legend of the golden fleece. And if you're still wondering who the Colchians were, try the most famous Colchian, a lady called Medea, and a bird, which the Greeks called the Pharsian bird. And as a result today, we call it the pheasant. But as I said, I can keep going on with examples of how these lost and forgotten peoples are all around us. But I want to finish by turning to another forgotten people. And that is you. Um, 500 years from now, you're going to be, and I can pretty much guarantee it, a lost and forgotten people. Our culture, our manners, our customs will all seem quaint and antiquated and totally out of touch with the modern world. Um, some of you may already feel that your grandchildren feel that way. And you may ask, what about New York, Paris, Berlin? And I'll give you Taxila, Akkad, and Mari. They were the metropolises of their day. I'm sure the people who walked in the streets there thought these things were going to last forever. Now we're not even sure where two of the three actually are. So just wait 6,000 years and we'll be in some future chapter because I'm sad to say it, we are not the apogee of human civilization. We are not the final chapter. We're another part of an ongoing story. And as I did with the book of the Forgotten Peoples, I finished with a verse by Kipling, which I have somewhat bowdlerized for the purposes of this talk. Um, and I'll finish by reading parts of it to you. Cities and thrones and powers stand in time's eye, almost as long as flowers, which daily die. Time is over kind to all things that be and makes us even as blind and bold as these. So in our very death and burial shore, shadow to shadow, well persuaded saith, see how our works endure. But I'm going to finish on a note of optimism. We should celebrate and remember the peoples who've gone before us. But however they passed, humanity has endured. So let's finish with Kipling's salute to the peoples of the future. But as the spring puts forth new buds to glad the hearts of men, from the spent and unconsidered earth, the cities rise again. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you so much to Matty for that um, fascinating talk with many examples taken from across, I was going to say across Mediterranean, but far further than that, actually. But um, to kick us off, looking at what we've currently got in the q and I just wondered, um, Matty, um, looking at sort of the question we've, question we've got here um, about myth and how you handle that question of sort of dealing with dealing with some of these stories, some of these stories you've sort of said come from archaeology, but some of them you said come from more these sort of, I guess, legends. How do you handle that? What do you think we can gain from studying myths? Is that okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Becca, for the chance to do some more blatant product placement since I've actually written a book, two books on it, <laughs> Myths of the Greeks and Romans and Gods and Goddesses of Greece and Rome. And in these, I examine the function of myth as a guide to history. And for example, when we look at um, the myth of Dionysius, who is the Roman Bacchus, we actually see from this the evolution of viticulture beginning in the Far East and moving west. We also know from archaeology that worship of Dionysius begins in the Far East, in um, places like the Hittite culture, and then moves to the West along with the idea of movement of peoples. On the other hand, Zeus is definitely a Cretan god. He's, and the, as the myth says, he is born in Crete. And when we read the myth of the struggle of the Olympians, against the previous generation of the Titans, a literally titanic battle, what we're actually seeing there is how the cult of the Olympians came to replace the cult of the previous gods in post mycenaean Greece. So what the myths are is actually history imaginatively retold an awful lot of the time. And bear in mind that, for example, if it wasn't for the myth of the Trojan War, Schliemann would probably never have gone and dug up the place. I mean, to be fair, we, we might have hoped that he did so someone else, he could have waited a decade till we had someone else go and dig it up. But um oh, moving, yes. <laughs> moving, moving on to moving on to the other questions we've got in the QA. Um so one another question from one of our participants is about sort of how knowledge gets lost. And that question of do you think these individual events, for example, the destruction of any particular library, this example, the Library of Alexandria, can really sort of you know be responsible for so much of our knowledge lost now? Or do you think that's sort of a bit of a myth in and of itself? You know, these one-off um, events can really explain so much, so much of our gaps. Well, if Julius Caesar hadn't been cremated, I would very much like to dig him up and whack him over the skull with his own shin bone for what he did to the Library of Alexandria. We have lost an awful lot. Um, and what has survived is pretty much the same as if you wandered blindfolded through a bookshop and picked books on random off the shelves. Um, there are whole histories. There's a guy called the Oxyrhynchus Historian. We've just got a couple of his pages of history because they were used for the equivalent of wrapping ancient fish and chips and chucked into a rubbish dump. Yet those few pages we have are such a valuable corrective on the works of Xenophon that we can tell that Xenophon is actually a lot of the time pulling a bit of a longbow and um, has a very biased approach to history. So what we have today is approximately three or five percent of the literature of the ancient world that has been lost. But how much of that knowledge is lost is another question. Um, I think one of the things about knowledge is it quite often gets rediscovered. So um, while I'd love to read some of those lost histories, and including some of the missing books of Tacitus, for example, um, I'm not sure how much of actual practical knowledge to humanity um, went down the drain along with various peoples and cultures. And one other thing before we go on that, by the way, I'd like to point out cuneiform tablets. If you want to have your, if your civilization is going to be destroyed, you need to put your records on clay tablets because when they burn down your palace, they bake it into ceramic and ceramic is pretty much indestructible. You can break it, but unless you grind it into powder, you don't actually destroy the tablets. So we've literally got tens of thousands of cuneiform tablets waiting to be deciphered. Um, so sometimes knowledge is preserved. Okay, brilliant. And I think that's somewhat that we might come back to it later if there's time answers one of our other questions we've got about whether just the act of having a written language is itself somewhat of a mitigation against being lost and forgotten. But I'm going to move on just briefly because we've also got some questions in various other directions. I think we want to try and hear it, you know, a wide range of the audience as possible. And um, I noticed that 
what but we've got one so one person sort of asking about the limits of your book when you talk about forgotten peoples where are you drawing the boundaries on this they've asked about america but i'm asking more generally where did you cut things off where did you just decide <laughs> okay i cannot study the entire globe this is where it ends actually we had the discussion when we were first doing the book because the book was originally arranged as lost and forgotten peoples and i said well i can't write that book my expertise is the ancient world in fact, I'm going out in the limb at times when I go on to Assyrians and things like that. So um, basically, the limits of the book are the limits of my expertise, to put it bluntly. And, and so we, I, I take it America, therefore, you know, f fell out of that limit somewhat. OK. Um, Completely. <laughs> OK, OK. Um, and build, building on from that, then someone else has asked, well, thinking about all the different civilizations that you mentioned in this talk, or maybe even those that you mentioned in the book as well, um, what do you think? What do you think is the civilization that most people should hear about or learn about? If you could only pick one of them that we all left remembering, which one would it be? Oh, go go with Catalhoyuk. It's a fascinating place. Um, this is the oldest city we know of, and they'd not advanced urban planning to the stage where they'd figured out the need for things like streets. So all the houses were built next to each other like honeycombs. And if you wanted to go and visit one of the people a few doors down, you climbed up a ladder from your house, you walked along the rooftops till you got to your destination, and then you climbed in and said hello to the people there. Um, and if you're, you wanted to talk to the ancestors, they were buried under the floor, so the floor kept rising as well. The other fascinating thing about Cattle Hoyok is they don't seem to have had gender roles or hierarchies. You don't find palaces, you don't find temples. And because they lived in these confined indoor rooms, we can tell how much soot settled in their lungs and then on their ribs. And men and women had equal amounts of soot, meaning that there were no indoor and outdoor roles. Um, women seemed to be in outdoors as much as the men. And we know that at least one of the women whose bones have been examined was a potter, because that deforms the bones in a particular way. So I quite like the idea of a city without gender roles or hierarchies, to be honest. And am I remembering this right, that Katal Hayok was also your example of this reverse development moment? Yes. Um, yeah, because someone of the, the answer questions has sort of asked if you could explain that again. I mean, does this have anything to do with the gender roles? Could you sort of tell us about, you know, how, you know, do we, does anything else we know about the city help us understand why that particular place decided to almost do the opposite of what we're expecting? Do you think it's unique? Or do you think this is just something that if we excavated more, we'd find more examples of this type of reverse development where what we think of as the natural order of things from hunter-gatherer to agrarian and so on, to cities and so on, actually would be a bit more challenged? Well, it's logical when you think about it. If you start with the assumption that hunter-gatherers can have a city, then when the climate is changing, you don't want to leave your city, but your agriculture or rather your food reserves are diminishing. So you need to find ways to enhance them. So instead of just gathering the grain, you start sowing crops. Instead of just rushing out and killing the nearest um, aurochs, you start domesticating cattle and sheep. In other words, in order to optimize your food supply, you're forced to invent agriculture. The alternative, is chucking it in, leaving your city and going back to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So um, once you presuppose the existence of the city, the rest kind of follows logically. Okay, well that, we're gonna, I think we're gonna move, move around again, just to again, keep this, you know, keep as many ideas in play as possible. And so question, another question we've got here then is, Okay, thinking obviously to do this, you must have read a lot of ancient historians and you must have, you know, some of them must have had more interesting stories about these lost and forgotten people than others. Are there any particular historians you would recommend to our audience if you are particularly interested in hearing about people who are maybe otherwise forgotten? Read Herodotus. I mean, reading Herodotus is rather like sitting next to a really garrulous, well-traveled friend on a bar stool. Um, he starts off with one story and says, oh, yes, and that reminds you of these people. Do you know that they have this fascinating habit of doing this and this? They're exactly like this people. And let me tell you about these guys, because they do this and this. And, oh, yes, that reminds me. And he always he wanders down not just a rabbit hole, but a rabbit warren, and somehow manages to come up at the other end, holding on to the thread of his story. So one example is he gives a wonderful story about the Thracians getting stoned on pot and how they'd go into tents and burn the stuff and come staggering out, um, bombed out of their minds. 
And from there, he moves on to a story of how the neighboring people um, steal gold from giant ants that they dig it up in the sand. So um, yeah, read, read Herodotus. Um, he's just a fascinating collection of yarns all strung together into a story. How far do you think they really actually reflect on these lost and forgotten people? How much do you think that these are really Herodotus trying to talk about the Greek people he's dealing with and just creating these examples, you know, creating examples of sort of fictive, you know, mirrors by which we can sort of say, okay, these people do these weird things, you know, and this helps us understand why we do what we're doing. You know, do, do you think that when we read Herodotus, we can read, we can read all these stories and go, right, that explains what these lost civilizations are doing? Or is there sort of more of a process that you go through when you read these stories and you try to sort of assess what, what we can recover? Um, well, with Herodotus particularly, you're looking at it through a set of mirrors. Um, for a start, Herodotus, and this is something people don't generally remember, is a subject of the Persian Empire, which is already a bit in decline. So he's got the idea of falling and declining empires in mind already. When he travels around both the Persian Empire and the Greek world, he's also spent a lot of time in Egypt, which at this time is a actual captive state of the Persians. And so he's looking at it, things from that bias. He's also looking at the biases of the people who are telling him these stories about themselves and their culture. And occasionally you look at it and think, well, okay, this is someone definitely pulling his leg. <laughs> and um, so you take that with a pinch of salt. Um, but he's an ethnographer. He travels around and he tells you about the people he sees and what he's done. In fact, at some stage, I intend writing a book called Postcards from Herodotus, where he, you basically get um, the little vignettes that he does from the various places where he's been. Okay, and I think this is probably going to be our final question. So I apologize to everyone who we haven't had time to answer. I am really sorry for that. I hope that when I'm giving you the outro, this will be a chance for Matty to hopefully just have a look at the questions and um, see if there's anything instantly that, that you know, that, that he can sort of, you know, note, note down. But um, what I wanted to end on is one of the, you know, you sort of mentioned this in your talk already, but someone's asked, well, thinking, think about what we know about the ancient world then. Do you have a just sense of just the scale of the loss? If we were, you know, you've mentioned that we'll all be forgotten. You've mentioned that most people <laughs> have forgotten. But if we were just thinking about the, what we do know about, say, I don't know, the ancient world, sort of percentage wise, is there any sense you can give us of, I guess, how much we know versus just sort of how many people, how many of these groups are just, you know, forgotten? Well, we know something just from um, the Assyrians who say, well, we conquered these guys, these guys, these guys, we chopped the heads off these guys, we burned the city of these guys, and we don't know who these guys are. They're gone completely. They're the 99.9% .9 forgotten peoples. How many there are? Um, well, we can't count because um, <laughs> how can you count the things you've forgotten? <laughs> By the way, I'd like to quickly point, ask, point out to the guy who said, the poem about the desertification of the Mesopotamian region the poem is called The Curse of Akkad. If you Google it on the internet, you can probably find a good translation. Okay, back to you, Becca. I think it'd be wonderful if we could all just thank uh, Matty for this absolutely fascinating talk, everyone. I don't know why I'm clapping, in my, clapping um, here in my office. <laughs> um, now, if you would like, after hearing all about it, to purchase a copy of Matty's book, Forgotten Peoples of the Ancient World, you can see my copy here then this will be available to purchase from the festival's partner bookshop, Fox Lane Books. For more information on book sales, please see the festival website, or you can head directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk forward slash festival hyphen of hyphen ideas. Now, for everyone at home, to Matty, to, you know, I'd just like to say finally, thank you once again for the questions. Thank you once again for joining us. And um, without further ado, then, I think um, goodbye and uh, thanks once again from the University of York and from Matty.